Thank you, everybody. Everybody hear me okay? Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I want to always say when I come across very smart people, I don't have a technology background. So I'm a, I'm a business guy. I've been involved in a lot of different ventures. Um, but when I find something that I'm passionate about, um, I really sink my heart and soul into it. And as Jameson said, in 2000 and late 2012, I started thinking about what this community can do uh, in terms of bringing innovative thinkers and money and venture capital. And so I set out this path of perhaps putting on conferences and helping people dialogue with one another. And it's been a privilege. And again, I've learned a lot from, from se se several of you here. I've gotten a chance to get to know. And um, I am putting forth an effort to pursue this effort, this uh, concept that I came up with about nine, 10 months ago now. And it's a privilege to have a chance to speak with you about it. So it's, a, it's sort of an informal presentation. Um, I do have a partner uh, who can't be here. And he uh, is sort of the technology brains behind this, uh, this venture. Um, I'm more of the application and the sales and marketing side of it. So I say that as a, not a full disclosure, but just to let you know that uh, the technology side of, our, of what we do uh, in my interpretation of it may look a little bit different than what some of you may interpret and you may have some different insight into it but I think the overall opportunity rests in taking the technology that we, we all obviously love and we're passionate about and in, in applying it to real world problems and I don't know of a lot of people I, I know uh, Don was talking about real estate experiences she's had of you know terrible closings and complications and people you know go through a 45 day 60 day process of buying a home and on their way to the closing they're still stressed out about it maybe it'll happen maybe it won't happen and so are, are there a lot of homeowners here curious okay and uh, I, I hope you've all had good experiences although I've been involved in a lot of different ventures my uh, background is in real estate finance so technically I'm a lo licensed loan officer I did own and operate my own mortgage company for about a decade um, so I have some first-hand knowledge of both the good and the bad of the industry and interestingly enough I've always thought about finding ways to improve uh, the mortgage industry the real estate industry uh, you know we can go and buy a hundred thousand dollar car and, and it's fairly stress-free we can walk out the same day why are complex financial transactions not necessarily made easier with utilization of technology, especially when we're talking about things like mortgages? So um, I had an epiphany moment earlier this year, uh, excuse me, in 2017. And it seemed to me like it allowed me to put all of the things that I've been a part of, real estate and uh, my other, you know, in interests and I've been involved in a biometric space and uh, it seemed like all of it sort of came together in my mind and I immediately set out this effort to put together Finest and I'm here to give you a little bit of insight as to what it is and where the background and the whole premise as to why I think it can really change things came from. Um, so uh, before I go through the formal presentation I want to give you a little bit more background. Um, traditionally mortgage lending is, um, is risk oriented in that if you have higher risk, at least the way the banks and the underwriters interpret it, and by the way, their interpretation of risk is also um, uh, limited, I think, because they've only been taught what they know. And uh, there are many people that I've come across that I would say are very low risk, uh, but the way the bankers and underwriters look at them, they would classify them as high risk just because maybe how their credit report looks, or maybe there's some element to their background that the underwriters just don't like. I, for for long, as long as I've been in, in the uh, mortgage space, that's one thing I didn't like. I thought there should be something more organic about how people's trustworthiness should be determined and deemed and fairer about it. Um, so that was something that I was always frustrated with. Um, another thing about mortgages is uh, there are cycles. And I lived through one of these expansion cycles in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, I'm here to tell you we're going through a very similar cycle now. Now we know what happened, what was a culmination of 
uh, the emergence and the growth associated with real estate in the 2000s leading up to 2008. Um, we all experienced a, a massive implosion. Um, market values plummeted. A uh, lot of foreclosure was, it was a horrific time. It affected global uh, markets and the global economy. So um, naturally, I'm also interested about finding ways to lessen the risk associated with that and chance of that happening again. So in mortgage companies, also look at how much you borrow um, in, in relation to the value of the home as also another risk determinant. So if you borrow 80% of the value of the home, then you're, you're at a less you know, risky position than if you were borrowing 97% of the home. And another interesting element that's taking place right now is you're hearing it on the radio. Uh, Freddie Mac just you know, recently announced another sort of loosening of guidelines. And what we also see with these cycles is that uh, the, those who are interested in all of us buying more property, um, they only really know to do one thing to stimulate it. And that is that they make lending or guidelines associated with lending easier or wider. Uh, we saw that in the 2000s. If you had a 620 credit score, you can borrow 100% of the value of the home. That eventually went to 580. Uh, eventually went to 560. So essentially, if you had a 560 credit score, which really means you have some serious issues with your credit, you could still get 100% financing. Then that also stimulated what they called subprime lending. Uh, subprime lending brought about uh, things like, well, if you can't really tell us what your income is, that's okay, we'll take your word for it. Um, that then stimulated things like appraisal waivers. So even though the banks say to you, you, the value of your home is an important indicator to us of, your, of the risk that we're taking in lending to you. But soon they started saying, well, you know what, we'll, we'll do some, some market analysis and we'll determine that value that that, uh, that that analysis gives us to be what we think the value is. The, the problem is all of this culminated into a very aggressive market. On one end, the politicians and the regulators, they were all sort of touting and, and how great the economy was and how there were so many homeowners. But on the other end, risk started continuing to grow and people were borrowing more than the value of the home. They were borrowing homes they couldn't technically afford. And in my determination, in our evaluation as a part of putting the project together, uh, we saw that leading up to 2008, there were some very defined characteristics of the market. And I'm here to tell you that that is happening again. Um, just today, I heard an advertisement, uh, uh, Rocket Mortgage. Everybody's heard of Rocket Mortgage. Uh, an ingenious marketing concept, but really void of any real technology. I mean, it's simplification of, of a process, and I get it, that's important. Um, but what they were touting is that first-time home buyers, they, are, they don't have to put 20% down. They only have to put 3% down. Now, this is what we're advertising. And what I'm also here to tell you is that Freddie Mac is also loosening guidelines with respect to appraisals. You have low inventory, and so people are very aggressive to buy homes. They think, again, we have such short, and I call it the goldfish syndrome. Uh, our, attention, our, our, our memory is so short that we've forgotten what happened just, just a decade ago. Um, but we have now realtors that are... Uh, uh, talking about how they're selling homes ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars more than the asking price. Well, let me tell you what an asking price is. An asking price that should be determined by a market professional is what somebody's willing to really pay for it. But then, because of low inventory and because of stimulation, people are saying, "All right, I'll pay more than what others are willing to pay for it." And then you have this arbitrary increase to values. And let me just tell you, that's sort of the the, the beginnings of in my uh, opinion and in my professional opinion, a downward cycle that'll commence at some point down the road. Now, I don't want this to be a, a fear-invoking, sort of a, a negative talk. I want to give you an idea of what stimulated me to start looking at ways to maybe do things better. This past summer, uh, in a meeting uh, with some title agents, uh, I found out that for the first time ever, uh, Fannie and Freddie had gotten into an agreement to allow people outside of the immediate family members to be able to contribute to an aspiring homeowner's down payment. Now, traditionally, as long as I've been in the business, which is 20 plus years, uh, and as long as I've known the guidelines, if you want to help someone with their down payment, 
the guidelines for most con conforming loans, it has to come from a family member. It can't be a, one of us in this room. It can't be uh, a, a neighbor. It has to be a family member. They deem that to be an important indicator of uh, whether or not the person that's receiving the gift to be um, looking at the opportunity in a, in a virtuous manner and thereby they believe that if it's a family member giving the money as a down payment, then they're more likely to not go into foreclosure and, and not make, uh, miss payments and so on. But now, Fannie and Freddie uh, were looking at letting other people contribute. And so I asked a question because immediately I started thinking about blockchain. I started thinking about smart contracts. I started thinking about what knowledge I have about this amazing technology. How could it play a role in the future of mortgages? So I asked the question um, and I said, so what is the criteria? Who can, you know, who does Fannie and Freddie say can contribute? And the title agent said, well, it's really undefined at this point, um, close friends. I said, I've got about 1,500 close friends on Facebook. Are you telling me that they couldn't give me a down payment? And there was some laughter in the room and, and she said, yeah, I guess that's what I'm telling you. And I said, are, are you telling me Fannie and Freddie is allowing crowdfunding the down payment? And again, some more laughter uh, of a bunch of banker types, and I res respectfully say they're very smart people, but um, innovation and technology sort of is secondary to them. And, and so she said, yeah, I guess that's what I'm telling you. So I went home with some of my notes. I called my business partner, uh, Eric Porper, who can't be here, so I'm flying solo tonight. But, um, and I said, I have an idea. And I said, if what I know about guidelines is, is true, and that is that when Fannie and Freddie usually try things, um, th it'll eventually get built into the guidelines. I think we have a unique opportunity to do a number of things. And my premise, and what I'm getting ready to present, is that there is a way, especially with millennials, especially with a younger generation, and with what is happening in the regulatory environment, this adoption of technology and innovation, there is a way for people to crowdfund their down payment and we intend to build a fully tokenized environment that would allow everybody involved in this process to, to benefit, to get something of value out of it. We want to reduce the risk associated with home ownership, meaning that if more and more people put a substantial amount of down payment down, it reduces the risk for everybody. We want to make sure that the risk is reduced for the lenders and banks because if they're lending uh, with less loan to value percentages and to more qualified people, then technically the economy benefits as a whole. And of course, we're able to get more and more people into homes. Uh, we simply want to create the right structure for them to create this process that works for them. And we think we have a perfect solution to achieve that. So I'll give it a, a whirl and give you a start into the finest. Finest represents the word finance, the F-I, and nest, which is essentially someone's home. Finest helps aspiring home buyers fund a down payment for their new home and with crowdfunding and an eco economic community. As I mentioned, the real estate cycle is vicious. The problem is that Everybody seems to sort of forget what happens. You know, we have a, an advisor, the very first time I presented this opportunity to him, and he, he, you know, he's, a, he's a traditional real estate guy, very, very successful, uh, is the head of a very large national company and in the real estate world. And he leaned back, we were having lunch in his chair, and he said, I don't like it. I said, why? He said, well, I, I'm tired of people, you know, I, I want people to save their down payment. I, I, why would I give to somebody else's down payment fund? And I said, fair point, but tell me what happened to your portfolio in 2008. What happened to your home's value in 2008 and 9? How long did it take for you to recover? I said, if we, ha if we can reduce that chance of that happening by some, some percentage, would you then think that there is some value behind this, this premise, this, this the thesis that we have, that we think that this could help people? And he said, and he leaned back in his chair and he said, okay, I, I think I get it now. And 
then he subsequently agreed to be one of our advisors, and I think that he now sees the broader vision of what, what we were talking about. Um, mortgage process is complex. Buyers are less likely to have a down payment than ever. Um, that is true. We've done the research on this, and I'm telling you, uh, millennials want to buy homes. Millennials now represent the largest segment of potential home buyers. And they absolutely want to buy homes. They want to bypass some of the complexities. They don't want to go through the hurdles. And they don't like being told no. So we think we have a solution towards their, their uh, goals. But we do think that millennials and others are definitely interested in buying a home. Risky lending is back. Unlike the 2000s, let me tell you who's doing risky lending. Fannie Freddie. Um, they're doing away with some of the guidelines that were just in place a year ago. Again, they seem to only know to do one thing, and that is widen guidelines until another 2008 happens. And home values have little incentive to be market driven. Now, one of the things that's important is we are definitely in a low inventory market, and I think we all experience that. We'll see short term benefits of that. Somebody willing to pay more money for our home. That's a, that's a good thing we think in the short run. But it is, it, it is an, a symptom of a cycle that has significant ups and downs. And we, we believe that communities, for example, where imagine an entire development where everybody has, you know, at least 20% down on their home. What would happen if one or two of those individuals were into some sort of a complexity or personal life issue and they had to sell their home quickly? Because they have equity, their chances of them walking away from it the chances of them giving up on it is less likely. Uh, please. Um, how do they have 80% equity? I, I must, I'm just confused. If this is crowdfunded, is it not a second mortgage? I mean, they have to pay their crowdfunding back, right? Yes. So they would still owe that 20% as well as 80%. I'm gonna, it's a great question. So you're, you're, you're saying, hey, if, if you're, if you're if you're finding a way to put that 20% down, they're going to owe somebody else, right? Is that is essentially what you're asking? Well, I would assume that's incentive for people to participate in this as the fund earners. Perhaps. We believe in a true gift. So what we're, what we're promising, oh, not promising, but what we're creating value behind is the chance of people to raise a down payment that is in the form of a gift. They are not required to pay it back. No different if the gifter was an uncle or a grandfather in our environment, we want the gift to be given, and we don't want there to be some sort of a, a quid pro quo or reciprocation. We want the gift giver to benefit, and I'm going to explain that, but no, there will not be a repayment of the down payment that we're going to help, help raise for the aspiring homeowner. Um, a virtuous cycle combining rewards-based crowdfunding education and community with a marketplace of lending advertiser opportunities and tokenization. This starts getting to the meat of our business. So we want to create lower risk. We want to write better mortgages. We want the process to be easier. Um, we want to give incentives. We want to give incentives to people buying a home. We want to give incentives for people to staying in their home. And we want to give incentives to people helping others buy a home. Transparency, education. Education is a critical part of what we're, what we're talking about. Um, a very uh, astute mortgage expert said to me, um, what are you going to do with pre-qualifying people as a part of your process? You're going to have to pre-qualify and deny most of the people that apply. And something that I applied in my personal uh, business, I don't believe in somebody not qualifying. I believe in somebody qualifying at the appropriate time for them. So I, as, as far as I'm concerned, everybody is welcome to participate in this. And as I go into the meat of it, I think it'll explain a little bit more of why, but we want everybody to participate. We just want to help them define whether they're likely home buyers in ten, ten, you know, six months, 10 months, 12 months, or two years. They all have a purpose in participating with, with the finest system, and we just need to help them define what their timeline is. Let me, let me go back to one other detail here. So. Um, let me give you an insight as to what the experience should be like with Finest. When somebody is aspiring to buy a home, maybe they have 5% down or maybe they have no percent down. They register with the Finest system. 
they open what they're doing to their community. And they say, look guys, I'm looking at raising some money for my down payment. I want to have a down payment in my home. I don't want to get 100% financing or maybe I don't qualify for 100% financing or some grants that are available. So I'm asking my, friend to help, my friends to help me. By helping me, our finest system is going to reward you for doing something virtuous and doing something good to, you know, for helping us. And so this rewards-based crowdfunding system, I think, is a, is a pretty, pretty neat concept and it works really well in this because there's a, uh, a entity called Honey Fund. Um, has anybody heard of it? I'm curious. Drago's utilized it. No, I'm kidding. It's, it's actually a, it, it's a, it's a uh, honeymoon fund. Think about that. There's now, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in crowdfunding. I, th I think it's a great concept. I think it's a great utilization of, of, of the community. Let me tell you what Honey Fund does. Honey Fund funds people's down, uh, uh, their um, honeymoons. And what was amazing to us through our research is when we were talking about whether millennials do this sort of thing, where they're, and it's not just millennials, but millennials are a great test case for us to, to help determine how well this can work. Well, they go and say, look, I'm, I'm marrying and I want to go to Hawaii. Will you help me, community? And the community says, sure. And let me tell you how much they help. Honey Fund, over the course of a, a few years, roughly five, five and a half, six years they've been in existence, has raised over a half a billion dollars for honeymoons. I think that's a pretty great thing, but what we say is that mortgages or aspiring to buy one's home is significantly more virtuous. And we do think if they do it for honeymoons, I think that they're very capable of helping their community with respect to down payments. So when people fund, the, fund these honeymoons, is it is it people primarily in tourist destinations that would fund people to take their honeymoons in that tourist destination? There is some elements of that that is emerging because as with most crowdfunding uh, environments, the true revenue parts of it hadn't, I mean, it's a fee-based thing. You, you, you raise a certain amount of money, then you charge five or eight percent. Um, so there is elements of that that's happening. There are essentially advertisers that are coming in and saying, look, do it here take your honeymoon here. And that's an important part because we are building pieces of that in, into our system. And I'll, I'll actually touch on that right now. So this, this aspiring home uh, buyer goes to their community and raises some percentage of down payment. The people that are giving the down payment help are connected with our, what we call our economic partners. And I'll use, it's not a, a direct uh, relationship by any stretch, but I'll use Home Depot as an example. Home Depot is a, a large entity that would like to advertise and market their services to aspiring homeowners and their community. So the people that are giving to the aspiring homeowners campaign have the ability to then look for products and services from a economic partner. The economic partner says maybe to this contributor, hey, you've, you've given $100, what a great thing to do for your friend. We're going to give you some goods and services at a discount. We're going to give you some coupons. Come, come, you know, spend your money with us, but we want to reward you for doing the right thing. And so there is this element of economic partnership that happens. As a matter of fact, what I envision is individuals who are aspiring uh, to buy a home and they're, as they're building their own personal economy around them, they can create their own strategic alliances with local businesses and vendors and, and, and larger businesses and then reach out to their community and say, these are the businesses that are supporting my effort. Please pay, patronize or uh, pay, be their patron. Please give them your business. And it gives some power back into con you know, control, if you will, back into the hands of that consumer to be able to create economic um, uh, participation and, and to stimulate economic participation. Um, Another example I'll give you how well I think the concept could work is uh, there's a lot of people that want to give money and in environments like Honey Fund, um, if you can't give money, then you can't really benefit the person who's raising a, 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 a fund for their honeymoon. But when somebody builds their community around themselves in, as a part of the finest network, they can also contribute without giving actual money. And how so? Well, I have economic partners that I've aligned myself with. If it's my campaign, I'm raising money for my down payment. And I might say to my few hundred community members, if you can give me money, great. If you can't, 
watch an advertisement from my economic partners and every time you do my economic partners will contribute towards my campaign so even if you don't have a direct ability to contribute you can indirectly help me by, patron, uh, by being the patron of these uh, supportive businesses, these economic partners. So it creates this exciting, what I feel, a very cohesive strategy of getting people and businesses to network and, co and collaborate for, for a better purpose. So does that touch on what you're talking about? Okay, let me move on. So um, going into the technology of it, um, we, we, we want to tokenize it because we believe, we believe in future-proofing and we believe a tokenized environment creates opportunities. So we believe, you know, we believe in a dual token system. So Finance will utilize a dual token system to ensure flexibility as we expand revenue streams and to meet multiple objectives of service. The Finance token represents an investment vehicle with an opportunity for um, appreciating value and participating in profit sharing. And the fi Finance transaction coin is a stable in value backed by one-to-one -one match in value in cash and cash equivalents. Here's why that was important to us. When we were first putting the project together, what kept us up at night is what happens if somebody's fund goes away? What if it declines in value? What if they raise their 20%, but because of the volatility of the crypto markets, what if it's no longer 20%, now it's 15%? So we didn't want that to happen. So we felt that the best way to create that safety net was to raise the funds in a stable token, match it one for one to say the US dollar, and then give a speculative uh, interest and in, in opportunity to investors by giving uh, a profit sharing uh, and a, reven and a uh, appreciability of the token back to the speculators and, and interested investors. So a dual token environment um, uh, is, we feel, is a good fit for us. Uh, may not be a good fit for every environment, but that stability was an important factor for us to uh, to make sure it was a part of our system. Um, any questions on that? No. Yes, sir. So would you say it's safe to characterize this as uh, a security offering token and a stable coin? Uh, so the, you know. Obviously, there's a lot of people who have a lot of problems with stable coins. Stable coins come in many different flavors. Uh, why should people trust that your stable coin is uh, is not like a fractional reserve? Uh, you know, what, how do you build that trust? Um, so, one of the things that we believe in is building a very traditional business with a very defined and provable revenue stream, backed up by audits. We want to build a very traditional business here using non-traditional, at least so far, non-traditional technology. So I think it's a critical piece, but what we're committed to doing is, we're committed to doing it the right way. Um, one of the reasons we have delayed our launch purposefully is to do more research, to garner more support, and go by way of the security token because we feel, whether we agree with it wholeheartedly or not, we feel that it's the safer direction for us to go. So it's gonna take time, but we intend to provide audited uh, financials. Uh, we we wanna make that available to our investors, we wanna make that available to the public at large. Um, we think that's a starting step. Um, the rest of it we're gonna have to earn, but one of the interesting things that we offer that I think um, there are some really good ICOs and, and innovative concepts that are out there. One of the things we offer is a very near-term revenue stream that uh, isn't two years or three years down the path. The, the path. Um, we actually intend to lend also to our aspiring homeowners. So we are more than just a environment by which we can raise some capital and, and put some technology together. We want to actually lend to the people. And let me give you a little bit more of an insight of the experience that I started telling you about, about this aspiring home buyer. Once they raise, or during the process of their raise, our system will continue to offer educational tools and resources to them so that that unqualified buyer that the bank said couldn't qualify and walked away from, we actually want them to register in the system. Heck, we want to have all college graduates register. 
We want to have all new uh, marrying couples to register. Forget registering at Target. Register with Finest. We don't need the pots and pans. Help us, help us raise our down payment for our new home. Part of what we want to do is sort of shift the paradigm back. You know, today, somebody finds and sees a home, they're like, I've got to have that home, and let's, let's make it happen in 30 days. That's fine. What we're also talking about is getting people involved in the process of preparing to buy a home in an earlier cycle, in an earlier stage, especially the millennials that I mentioned. And I believe our system could help them do that. But this aspiring homeowner, uh, as they're raising their, their down payment, they're becoming educated of what it means to understand their credit, uh, some ways to get out of debt if they're in debt, good informative information for free. We, we, we want to provide this as an educational element. And while they're doing that, we also want to pre-qualify them. We want to go through, as a matter of fact, the whole underwriting process, ideally, so that by the time that they're done with their raise, they'll be fully approved. I'll give you an example of how a go-to-market strategy for us could work. So having some in, you know, inside knowledge of how the real estate work, uh, markets work, um, I anticipate knocking on the doors of some major real estate companies. And, and I know some of these numbers firsthand, but one of the larger ones, Remax, for example, we don't have a relationship with them or anything. I can go to Remax National and say, hey guys, how many applicants were turned down? Or how many applicants walk through your doors, walk through this home buying process with one of your agents, who's commission based, and ended up not buying a home because they could not qualify? I know that that number is to the, to the thousands every year from one agency. And we could say to them, why don't you turn those uh, denials over to us? Let us cultivate them as buyers. Let's educate them. Let's help them raise a down payment. Let's give them some resources and tools to improve their credit. And then in three months or six months or nine months, whatever their uh, cycle is, we'll bring them right back to you but not when they're 60 days away from buying, but when they're maybe six days away from buying. We just need some uh, inspections and appraisal and title work to take place, and hopefully eventually all that will be done by way of the blockchain. But we can say to them that this is a pathway to get all of these people that have been denied, that are going to sit in their rented apartments, and there's nothing wrong with that by, by any stretch, but who want to buy a home. And rather than them sort of being at the mercy of some, some you know, uh, arbitrary mechanism that gets them to buy again or look at buying again at some point down the road. Let's cultivate them to become really good uh, prepared buyers. And we'll bring them right back to you and you benefit, the buyer benefits, and we as an entity benefit. So we do intend to lend and that gives us a near-term revenue model. So near that we, since we already have the built crowdfunding platform and we already have the lending piece of it put together, that technically, after our raise is complete and our launch is complete, technically within a few months, however long it takes to somebody to raise whatever amount of down payment they desire, could be months, we can close our first loan. Now that, going back to Jameson's important question about trust, I think as we demonstrate our real revenue model uh, that's coupled and backed up by audited financials and a degree of transparency that we intend to employ as a part of our launch and uh, business development. I think over time we, we hope to earn that trust. Sorry, yes, please. Why did you decide on using the blockchain and not really going in a traditional funding model? So um, the best way I, I can, my personal reason is, is future proofing and I know it's probably a, a cop out answer but that really is true. But there are some reasons why, and I'll give you some specifics. One of the underlying, and it's a part of our presentation, and you'll see a little bit about it. One of our things that, you know, number one, going back to 2012 and 13, when I first met Jameson, we were talking about Bitcoin. And we were talking about how Bitcoin will not only enter more people's homes, but how it would become a, a function or utility to more and more people. We were literally knocking on doors, getting, trying to get businesses to accept it back then. So there are today two businesses in you know, restaurants in Raleigh, technically, that accept it. That's a 
bit of a disappointment to me. But my point to that is that adoption changes sort of shape and doesn't sometimes happen the way you want. So uh, there are some things that we think we can do to take utilization of blockchain a step forward. Back then, people always asked the question at Cryptolina and other conference that I attended, what can we do to get more people to use Bitcoin? I felt then, as I do now, by, by creating a path for people to utilize technology like this in their everyday lives, but without making them uh, jump through too many hoops or without making them feel like they have to sort of, you know, create some complex process for their days, if you can create a pathway for them to participate without feeling that they're doing something outside of what their normal days are about, then I think we have a winning strategy for not just Bitcoin, not just this project, but all blockchain-oriented projects. So what I think we sort of achieve by incorporating a blockchain element, and there's specific details I'm going to give you, is that step forward, because we're going to get people to participate in tokenization. And the stable token, for example, as far as they're concerned, it's, it's, it's a point. I mean, you could, we can market it any way we want. We can market it as a point. We can market it as an equivalent of a dollar. It doesn't have to be a, a, a token the way they perceive it. It is, but we're going to get them to participate in it without having to go through a whole lot of steps. So, but, but the specific answer to your question is we want to tackle the credit reporting issue. We think the credit reporting system is, is horrible. Uh, that's my personal experiences with it. I have a, a, a lady that's 82 that can't refinance her house because she is continuously late on one credit card and she has a 500 something credit score. I have another client that has a 750 credit score, two bankruptcies, not one, two bankruptcies and a judgment. So I'm not saying either one is less or more credible, but what I'm saying is a credit reporting, the current systems aren't uh, sufficient to really qualify or disqualify people in the way they currently operate. Now we know we heard that IBM and Experian are now starting to work together. I mean, it's good to see that, but we feel we, we create a platform where uh, real solutions to issues like an archaic credit reporting system can be made. So we call uh, a system within our network an IQS, an individual quality standard, and uh, we believe that quality standard encompasses and will encompass way more than how much you owe on your credit cards. Uh, we, please. Sorry, just a follow-up. Please, yeah. I don't want to stress this point too much, but uh, one challenge which we are seeing is all the organizations which are trying to adopt the blockchain platform. Sure. Obviously, the regulatory environment is very unclear across True. the regions, right? You go to any country and you see those challenges. So. What is that driving factor for you to really go and deal with that uncertainty around all of the regulatory environment, knowing that this business needs regulatory environment defined to a certain extent? That's a great question. I don't know if we have all the answers, but the mortgage operation will run just like any mortgage operation today. The real characteristic of the, the crowdfunding and, and the blockchain environment will happen uh, at an arm's length, I mean, albeit connected, but an arm's length to what the mortgage closing. So, so to your question, the mortgage operation won't, uh, we, we'll have to adhere to HUD and, and all the other existing regulatory uh, requirements, which, which we already do and we, we, we will continue to. Um, where the only thing that's evolved is the, the Fannie Freddie willingness to accept down payment from somebody other than a family member. That's sort of the, the way I see that's the spark. So uh, I, 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 I'm sure I'm not the only one that recognized that spark, uh, but that's where I recognize the spark. Now, there is a lot of blockchain, wonderful blockchain projects um, that are taking fractional ownership, and, and, and we're very much interested in all of that. But to us, we feel there's a much larger opportunity to engage average when I say average, I mean that in a respectful way, but, but regular consumers who are aspiring homeowners. St some statistics that are out are, are really interesting to us. Um, uh, and I'm jumping around a little bit, but I, I hope it's, it's informative. Um, so it, USA Today had an article. Um, I've shared this with, with a couple of my friends in here uh, just a few weeks ago. And it was the, the eight ways millennials can prepare for homeownership. And it, it just reminded me how, uh, how much we are going down the right path and also how disconnected pretty much the rest of the world is on 
why millennials aren't buying more homes. We know the obvious reasons. They're millennials, and there's some in here. Uh, there's a lot of subscriptions, and you know, there's a lot of technology, and, and there's some very, very obvious reasons. But the reasons that USA Today, or the, or the basis that USA Today gave, or, or the examples of what millennials can do, was, was unbelievable. Save. No shit. I mean, we, we know that. That's not innovational. That's not inspirational. The other one was um, join the military. Now, I can't think of a more honorable thing to do, but th that's what USA is saying for a millennial to buy a home, join the military. If you want to join the military, wonderful. It's, it's a tremendous honorable thing. But that's not, you know, you don't buy a home because, you, you know, just because you join the military, vice versa. Um, my favorite is um, cash out of your inheritance early. Um, I don't have an inheritance. I mean, I'm certainly not a millennial, but those of you that are closer to the millennial age, I mean, I don't know how many people in America do have a legitimate inheritance, but that's their reasoning. So point being is um, we're going down this path because there's some defined objectives um, and things like future-proofing, things like um, an IQS or a better credit reporting system, um, a better underwriting system, use, utilization of smart contracts. I mean, the way we envision it and you know, uh, we have a lot of detailed analysis on this, but the, the underwriting process could be made infinitely smart, uh, easier with, with utilization of smart contracts. And it could elevate the process by which how long it takes. Because right now, it's again, somebody sitting in a cubicle, uh, the coffee just spilled on his co computer, and that's somebody's loan that's going to now sit aside for three hours, even though all of the achievables have been achieved. So the reason it has to be on the blockchain is a starting point to ensure that we have the ability to incrementally in inject more and more of usable functions of the technology without frightening the people or without making them feel that they have to do you know, some crazy stuff to participate in this. So blockchain is important for those reasons. Eventually or short term? Both. Well, um, I know there's people in here that can talk to that. A uh, couple of people I know that can talk to that effect much better than me. But what I envision about it is a, you know, from my interpretation of it, is that um, during the underwriting process, particularly, um, what I envision is the consumer going through the cycles with achievables with respect to their credit. You know, things that are accomplished and completed graduating them to the next stage of, of sort of evaluation and participation in the system. And then once they are approved, um, I, I call the system, I used to call it 20 years ago, I had this vision of a pre-underwritten loan uh, so that it simplifies and streamlines the process. But essentially, if they meet certain qualification standards, then it already it automatically goes, and it does not need someone to validate it, it goes to the next level. But beyond that, then it goes to a series of closing preparation and quality control measures. Again, this is done much more efficiently by utilization of smart contracts because there is human error involved, there is misinterpretations involved. Um, I believe that once we get to a point where this can be done on the uh, by utilization of smart contracts, much more accurate, much less risk. Uh, involved, but beyond that, once the loan is closed, the documents, ought, you know, again by utilization of smart contracts, can go to the servicing agency, because there's other elements of of, of the mortgage process beyond closing, uh, and servicing, and the assurance of making sure payments are made on time, and not only made on time, but but uh, properly registered on a credit report like system, uh, perhaps the IQS system. So. Um, Again, from the layman's perspective and as a non-technologist, I see the streamlining of all of the things that require a signature or a check or something and 
you know, uh, I'm a big office uh, space fan, you know, what do you do here? All these people that said, you know, and th there's really nothing happening, but they're taking the file from here to there. That's wastes time. And consumers deserve better than that. I think home buyers could get a much more efficient and much quicker and safer process. So I may not be able to touch on the technology as much, and I apologize ahead of time, but that's my interpretation and vision of how it would work. Um, finest coins are pledged towards a campaign and made available when the campaign conditions are met. If conditions are met, the tokens are returned, or not met rather, the tokens are returned to the contributor. So if somebody makes a contribution and the individual does not meet their objectives or they end up, end up not buying a home, we think it's imperative that the contributors receive their money. They might then decide to, because it will be returned to them in, in the way of a token, they can use that in our marketplace, they can use it to uh, uh, transact with some of our contributing uh, uh, economic partners or what have you, but it must be returned to them. So, uh, question. Yes. Since these are, this is split, half token, half coin, one stable, one... one dynamic or... One or, dynamic, yeah. whatever you want to call it. When you're talking about somebody getting their their investment back, is that coming from which which, which one is that is it coming from if their investment is immediately split, what comes back what comes back to it, them? It, it will always stay in the in the stable token unless you decide to take it out of it. So if you have a contribution, it has to be made in the stable token and you have to receive it back in the form of a stable token. We don't want the, the variable aspects of the, of the marketplace to affect the value of someone's contribution. We want to protect that contribution at all costs. Um, so it, it, what they give and what they receive will, will be done in, this, in the stable token. With no opportunity for, for growth or over, t over time, I make an investment and it's either going to be part of somebody's down payment or I get something back, and it is, is it without any appreciation over time? In the current stage that we're launching, yes. Uh, uh, excuse me. In the current stage we're launching, no, there is not the way to do that. In the uh, 2.0 version or some, some near-term version, we are looking at how to facilitate that. So uh, I, I completely understand why that's important, but um, we're also concerned about... Uh, launching th this to the masses and then creating a, uh, uh, a going back to Jameson's point about trust, we don't want to do anything that could rather rapidly reduce someone's trust in, in the value. And so in the early stages, we still believe, as, as, as though we believe in what you're saying, it's safer for us and safer for our uh, early stage participants to always transact on the transaction token, meaning they contribute or receive back in the transaction token. The, the dynamic token, uh, or the variable token, will have appreciab appreciability, but it will be tied to um, our profitability as a company and our profit sharing uh, element that we build into it. So we well, want... That's, that's just it. Profit, sh profit sharing. Why aren't the people who are investing part of the, uh, part of the stockholders that, that get you know, okay, this didn't work, but I get some. I, I get something back from the 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 growth fund. Uh, we are the gross uh, half of this. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, let me let me share. Let me take that a step further, and, and not really a step further, but sort sort of a uh, a uh, a uh, tributary. Um, one of the things that I would love for this to be a part of would would love to be a part of my my uh, this concept is. The ability to have people benefit from uh, the ownership of real estate as a whole. And so like what some of the fractional ownership groups are doing, we're going to buy 10 properties or 30 properties or 100 properties and where, you know, whatever we sell them for or flip them for or whatever, the uh, investors will get a piece of it. We like that concept. We feel like that would probably uh, create a degree of uh, speculation and, and concern on part of the regulatory groups that might look at us as a traditional lender. So um, the other thing that I would love to do is I would love to use our system to go and buy properties or even construct properties in low crime areas but that are startup properties for people with such a low inventory for example and what we could say to them is if we have the right structure and we build it at 60 cents to the dollar 
we can say to an aspiring buyer, hey, look, you can, you can raise your own money and we'll, we'll give you the system to do that and we'll get you pre-qualified. But let's just say you don't, but you want to buy one of these properties, we'll give you a gift of equity of 20%. So what I envision is in a structure like that, you're incentivizing that individual aspiring home buyer, but there is a way to also incentivize a potential investor that helps facilitate the construction and, and or purchase of that property. So I, I, I see it, I'm very concerned about making that a front and center element of our, of our project early on. I, I, don't, I don't want to devalue it at all, we, we, we understand it, but I'm, I'm more concerned, Having, knowing what the mortgage regulatory environment is, we're going to be introducing a significant amount of technology to them, and we feel that the more structured we present the lending side to be, that uh, I think will help us in the short run but we intend to incorporate elements of what you're referring to um, at some point not so distant in the future. We, we see it, we recognize it, we are sort of made a conscious decision to put a, a, a barrier to not jump over that too early. Um, let me move on. So we, we touched on education, uh, we, again, very, very important piece of what we do. Um, finest coins are, are pl pledged towards educational goals and uh, uh, you know, if they're made available when, when certain conditions or certain goals are met. I'll give you an example, I'm, I, I like sharing examples because it allows me to share my vision. Uh, a, a father could say to a, a college grad's daughter or son, hey, I, you know, once you achieve this, I'm gonna give you, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna help support your down payment uh, once you get your degree. Or, so that's one piece of it so that the, um, the campaign could be structured so that, uh, 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 achievables can be set and determined by the campaign or the campaign support system. Uh, but also we have our, we intend to build a series of educational initiatives um, that includes everything from credit awareness, debt uh, aversion, and, and making sure that people are understanding of how uh, interest rates work and, and, uh, and uh, amortizations and things of that sort. We find that uh, especially millennials, this information is just vastly missing from a lot of what they're taught, even at the university level, and we think it's an important service that we would offer. Um, the mortgages, we feel, are a starting point for us. It is a very real and very near-term revenue model, and it's something that we feel can sustain us for a long time and, and make the company very successful. But we also believe in the marketplace, and I'll run through it very quickly, but um, we feel that the marketplace, when we're talking to people who are aspiring buying a home, and they're reaching out to their community and connecting with them and asking them to engage, we feel like that creates a very um, uh, strong bond, and we think uh, quite confidently that that's gonna help to cre create a marketplace that people will continue to in engage and interact with one another. So for real estate, uh, real estate and lending professionals can leverage the finest lending platform to set criteria, um, purchasing power, our individual quality standard or, or score, time to buy, and more to help consumers find the right match by acquiring a finest, uh, they can, uh, finest coin, they can expand their pool of available opportunities. Uh, in essence, in real estate, it's just a simple stepping stone. Uh, we think that there could be in the future other engagements beyond real estate, uh, other complex financial transactions and so on. But real estate naturally serves as the stepping stone for us. For businesses, businesses can use finance to create and distribute ads driven to consumer on demand. So um, we're all aware of what, what current ad mar markets are like. Um, uh, we feel that when you have a concentrated group of individuals who are aspiring to do something for their community, they have a lot of attention that they're willing to give to a supportive economic partner. We'll use the example of Home Depot again. So we feel like businesses, we can uh, create a very uh, sort of a cohesive partnership between businesses and aspiring homeowners and their, and their community. And then we can create ad directed to those communities uh, from the economic partners. Um, for consumers, uh, consumers use finance to crowdfund, earmark towards down payment of their loan. Um, and uh, eventually consumers build their uh, individual quality standard uh, through crowdfunding or other attributions, the consumers pool available opportunities grow. Consumers also earn reward tokens for building their IQ. So the more um, they're willing to participate, 
the way we can also continue to reward them at, at higher levels. So we, we want to reward participation in the marketplace. The more of their educational initiatives they complete, the more of their down payment that they raise. As they engage us, the system will continue to reward them. We have some nonprofit discussions and uh, something I'm passionate about, uh, homeless veterans and other things that we think we can also tackle um, once we get, get off the ground. So um, that's the essence of the presentation. Uh, there are some other details to it, obviously, but um, I'm, hopefully you guys have some questions for me that, that I've not touched on. Um, there's certainly um, what, what we envision, and just so you know where we are in the cycle, we've, we've gone through our initial seed round, and uh, we have a great consulting group that we're working with. Um, we are now in the uh, development of the back end, the technology. We own the crowdfunding platform, so that's ready to go. We have a wonderful and very um, properly positioned uh, uh, mortgage lending platform. And uh, so what we intend to do is um, uh, go through a second seed round, and that will allow us to um, complete our SEC registrations, and uh, we hope that a little bit later in the year uh, we will be a SEC compliant um, uh, offering. So we intend to do that hopefully before the end of the year, fall at some point. But um, this has been fun. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you, and, and I appreciate the questions. If you have any more, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a, it's, you know, it's a great question. Um, fraud happens every day in real estate. Um, we've identified some things that we, we feel we can do. Um, we feel that, especially for somebody that maybe is younger, who may not have the traditional attributes of a buyer, such as a down payment or, or the right type of credit or what have you, for them to go through a multi-month cycle uh, and to get into the home, to walk away from it, we feel is a lesser risk than where things were in 2007 and 2008 when the same individuals were getting their home and they weren't putting any money down and they weren't going through any process. So it's, it's likely to happen. I can't say that it won't ever happen in our system, but the benefit of what we offer is if we can create a system where more people have a substantial down payment, it doesn't have to be 20%, by the way. It could be 15%. Somebody can come to the table with 10% and say, I want to try to get to 20% so I don't have to worry about this thing called mortgage insurance, which is ridiculously expensive. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you as a consumer pay for it, but you're really protecting the bank. But let's assume that for a moment that you, will, you know, this person is going to go and they're going to live in the home for a year and they're going to walk away. The reason the 20% down mark is important and why we sort of use that as a baseline uh, that we want people to aspire to get to, because banks traditionally realize that if they had to sell a property, that was acquired by way of a foreclosure, that they have about 80 cents on the dollar on the home. So if the person, this young person, bought the home, they put 20% down, they raised the money in our system, and for a year later they decide to walk away, we can't really force them to stay, but at least the risk is mitigated with respect to the bank. I guess I focus too much on that one specific scenario. I was Please. also like, just other scenarios, just taking into account greed, both the user side and also, I mean, investors are greedy too. They want to get something out of it. I mean, unless this is going more and more you know, towards the kind of like uh, the GoFundMe, where it's just complete charitable-based uh, donations. Um, whereas like Kickstarter, you, you get something out of it. So you, you're the human nature of greed. You're still getting something in return. Right. Um, or like the the buyer of the home, if they sold the property, does the twenty percent go back to? Or does it, uh, they just get a pocket or so, great question. So, um, one of the things we wanted to do is create a, a reward for giving. And because the giving has to be a gift, legally it has to be a gift. It can't be, I can't give you 20% for your down payment and then expect something in return for it, unless I'm a lender. And so, 
uh, we can't return. So if somebody walks away and the bank, it's a loophole kind of thing. yeah. Uh, so we can't we can't give the money the twenty percent back to the people who gave the the money. But the house could have appreciated. Uh, the house could have depreciated. There's no question. But the risk that's being taken at that point is the bank who has to recoup the majority of the investment that they've made into lending. And for the economy as a whole, what we have to do is we have to make sure that bank, I mean, I, I, I'm not like extremely passionate about banks. I'm not, you know, I think there's corruption in all major financial institutions. But having said that, the bank must be protected because it's good for the economy as a whole. It, it's good for my property's value. It's good for your property's value. So, but what, what, what I'm referring to is that that person that gave that 20, or the persons, the community that gave that 20%, we actually believe that if it's your network, you, you collaborated with your network of 20, 30, 50 friends from social media or what have you, and they gave you the 20% as a gift, we actually assert that there is probably a lesser chance of you walking away from it because you have a degree of familiarity with, with your network. Now, there might be lots of people you don't know and you might not care about them, and I don't, I, I'm referencing you as this individual that's walking away. I don't mean to. This, this young guy who decides to walk away from the property. But, that, but let me tell you what's more likely to happen. If, if that person is more educated, understands how much equity they have, rather than walking away from it, why don't they just sell it? And we intend to create a system to make not only buying easier, but selling easier by making sure that there are uh, reputable agents uh, that are part of our system that can achieve what you're talking about rather quickly. When you have 20% equity, um, you know, that's 20,000 R's on a 100,000 R house, 40,000 R's on a 200,000 R house. Why would you walk away from it? Sell it at, sell at a slight discount and still walk away with a substantial amount of money. So once you have equity, we assert, that creates an environment where you don't, as a matter of fact, I, I know this firsthand, so in, in, the, in, in 2008, in 2007, 2009, people talk about adjustable rate mortgages. Do, do, do I have any other mortgage experts in here? Anybody, uh, not that I am, but, but you, uh, my experience with it and the research that I did is it wasn't adjustable rate mortgages that created, we, we, we heard that on the, on, the, on the media because they said the foreclosures are happening because of all these aggressive adjustable rate mortgages. But that wasn't really what happened because the, the uh, margins that were used uh, and the index that was used that you come up with an uh, adjustable rate is use a, an index and a margin were so low that most of the people that had adjustable rate mortgages, th their rate hadn't gone up, but they were still walking away from it. Why were they walking away from their homes when their rates, their payments that they agreed, they signed the paper, they agreed to pay, hadn't gone up? They were walking away because they recognized they were sometimes 10, 20, 30 percent underwater in their property. I think also what he's getting at is what's stopping someone from using this as an avenue just to acquire wealth in the sense of let's get, you know, 20 percent down payment, wait a year, sell it for, you know, X amount of money and then move on to the next operation. Yeah, My thought yeah. is you could maybe get away with that once, maybe twice, but if you're part of the system and you're like vetted, people are going to catch on to the fact you're buying houses over and over, right? Great point, uh, Drago. So, the system, especially with utilization of blockchain, I think eventually we'll have some safety nets that can be built into it, but there's nothing that's stopping you today doing that. It's called property flipping. There are people having conferences and you know all over the country doing just that. You buy a property at a reduced value, you turn around and flip it in sometimes three weeks, six weeks. Yeah, so the, 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 main, the main thing I was trying to apply is that's a lot of times it's what I agree or speculation, but this is like a category of Right, I, I see your margin. point. Yeah. Yeah, you don't even have to, you actually could, I don't know, throw a huge party and trash the place and still sell it and walk away with, like you were saying, 20 or 40 grand. And I mean, there's a lot of intelligent, less than 30 year olds who would see this and immediately read the fine print and take advantage of that. I'm pretty sure. It's an excellent <laughs> point, and, and, I, and I do understand. We certainly intend to build in mechanisms that would try to determine the likelihood of somebody doing that. It's not vastly different than what people do today. Um, as a part of the IQS system, as we see what people's habits are, and people are sort of, you know, for example, um, a, a, a peer, a colleague of mine said, uh, you know, what is trust? You know, wh why don't we want to reward people for doing trustworthy things? And, and, and somebody that donates money to, to charity, 
isn't that a, a virtuous thing? Isn't that a good thing? And so does that not contribute to someone's trustworthiness? So for example, if we have a system that allows these types of engagements to be recorded and used as a determinant of someone's worthiness, not just credit worthiness, but worthiness is overall, or, um, I feel like we can incorporate it into a system like this, and blockchain's already tackling that. I mean, there's, you know, I went to a conference in San Francisco, and every other booth was about trust. So we're not looking at, um, uh, we're not looking at conquering that issue. We think there's enough elements and, and technology innovation out there that's doing that, but we certainly want to apply some of what's happening to determine we can't, it, it will never be 100% fail safe and, and it will not be 100% accurate, but I do think we can employ elements of this trust factoring to reduce the risk of that happening. But you, you, you make a great point and, and that risk is definitely there. We think that somebody could come in and, and do that, but we do want to try to stay a step ahead of them and we can employ some techniques to help eliminate the risk, hopefully. Yes, sir. Uh, write off on your taxes? So you mean the gift? So we, we have a number of ongoing uh, communication lines on this. Yeah, so, so it works pretty, pretty much similarly to what any other type of you know, uh, crowdfunding platform works. So you, you technically can't receive a, uh, a quid pro quo or some sort of a return on giving the money. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why our reward mechanism is designed to come by way of uh, economic partners offering incentives and, and coupons and other things like that. Um, the, the gift giver, if it's a family member that's a direct gift, uh, there are some limits on what they can do every year. Uh, as an individual, there's also state-specific limits on what they can give. Um, I believe in, at some point in the not-so-distant future, that there is going to be a threshold that as long as you stay under the threshold, that um, certain types of crowdfunding environments will facilitate a, uh, a sort of a charitable contribution type of uh, element to it. But as far as we see it right now, no. In today's uh, uh, environment, it's not currently registered as something you can write off on your taxes. But we're investigating it further. You have the thing that's more of an idea that I was talking about. I'm a military veteran. Yep, absolutely. I'm Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, if we renege on the mortgage, then the VA stuff is a bill for the zero down. Exactly right. Yep. Which could be ten, twenty thousand dollars, whatever the ten percent is. That money comes from basically everybody here. And yep. It's the taxes that go into the budgeting for the VA that support all that. I think this would be a good project to present to the VA to help save taxpayer money and have an incentive back. Uh, I, I, thank you for your service. I cannot agree more. Um, uh, it, there's, there's more to the veteran side, by the way, and I'll just, I, I totally agree. I think the, the VA could be a strong supporter of ours. Um, we we want to help veteran homelessness. We, we're, that's something that I'm, I'm personally very passionate about. Um, we want to help homelessness as a whole, but w there's a number of things that I think we can do. There's another relatively near-term opportunity that even without the VA's support early on, we can do, and that is help <clears throat> helping people. <clears throat> excuse me, helping people reobtain their uh, entitlement. Dry throat. Sorry, helping the veterans that have lost their entitlement be able to reobtain it, because all the entitlement is, but what uh, may not be understood, the VA loan is basically an insurance, just like an FHA loan is basically an insurance. That's really what you're getting. You're still getting the loan from a lender. You're still getting the loan um, from, from a bank. The, the VA or the FHA really is an insurance product. And so what the VA says to you is for your service, they're giving you the, the coverage of the insurance of this sort of the, the difference between the 80 and 100% of the value. And they're, they're giving that insurance to you on your behalf. And if you were to walk away, and, and foreclosures in the VA community unfortunately is high. Uh, and if you walk away from it, you're going to lose that entitlement and you won't have access to it again. Which is unfair because everybody goes through various cycles of their lives. And I've gone through 
major ups and downs in my financial well, uh, life, and so do veterans. So somebody who's lost their entitlement will never be able to utilize that despite the fact that they're still a veteran, they still fought for the country. So a near term opportunity there is to help people raise or crowdfund through our system their entitlement to be able to acquire a VA loan again. And then some, and because on a VA loan, you don't have to get 100% financing. You can put 10% or 5% or 20% down. Most people just opt not to do that because there's no reason to. It's 100% financing and uh, you, know, you can use that money for other things. I understand the value of it, but um, there are ways that we can use our system to educate government institutions and entities, VA and FHA uh, and others like the Department of Agriculture, and we can create our system we can use our system rather to create efficiencies for aspiring buyers without increasing the risk. Uh, a Forbes article came out just a few weeks ago. There's some things that have been stimulating us as we're doing, doing this, you know, going down this path. And the, the Forbes article uh, stated that there were a number, there was four items that they identified as the next trillion dollar opportunity. And uh, the junk bonds, not that I'm a fan of junk bonds, but junk bonds are sort of back in the equation of the next trillion dollar idea. Uh, there was a couple of other things that I didn't really pay close attention to, but the fourth item on there was real estate for millennials. It stated if somebody can figure out how to get millennials into homes, then that is the, an, one of the other next trillion dollar concepts. We feel that combination of everything that we're talking about, um, and it's not just millennials, it's all, it's all aspiring home buyers, but certainly millennials are a target of ours, that we can help serve uh, it to, to have a piece of that trillion dollar market. There's one other piece that I didn't touch on, and that is that there's actually global applications for what we're talking about. So this is certainly a, a domestic uh, initiative and, and startup, but we, we have uh, uh, colleagues and, and advisors that are overseas and in, in Europe, for example, and they feel that the same things that are happening here with wider guidelines, riskier loans are happening there. On one end, we're trying to stimulate home ownership. On the other end, we're decreasing the guidelines and uh, qualification standards. So it's an issue that is there as well. And we've been told that we have an opportunity beyond domestic interest to perhaps tackle the same issue in other parts of the world, emerging markets and such. So any other questions? We're actually out of time. Just yeah. One, one more okay. Are, are you monetizing any part of the platform, for example, the crowdfunding platform Am I, mon am I using the crowdfunding platform to monetize? Um, uh, we believe inherently that crowdfunding is a, is a utility. We don't believe it's a business. So there's a lot of businesses that have made a lot of money, but it's hard to take six, seven percent of somebody's raise that's going to somebody's heart transplant. Um, we have a hard time with that. So th there will be some transactional um, costs associated with it, but only in instances where um, uh, somebody who, let's say, raised money, and this sort of goes to your question, um, and they don't want to use it for its intended purpose, well, we want to let the contributors decide whether that purpose, uh, that purpose can change. And if the contributors, you know, don't c come up with some sort of a unanimous decision of somebody says, look, I, I don't want to buy a house anymore, I want to use this to pay off my student loans, well, the contributors should have a say-so in that. And if that person wants to then use it for an unintended purpose, uh, then there should be a transactional fee associated with it, because th because our near term and relatively you know midterm revenue is is mostly on the mortgage side. Eventually, uh, the amount of ad dollars that we we feel we can get will uh, you know be significantly more than what the mortgage operation uh, entails. But we anticipate, based on our financials, that a roughly a 16 month window of time to become. Uh, sort of um, in the black, if you will, that we, we will have, we'll be able to generate enough revenue. And we're using very conservative numbers to, do, to come up with that figure, uh, just on the mortgage. So no ad dollars included, but uh, very minimal uh, on the crowdfunding side. Most of the crowdfunding for every aspiring buyer will be essentially free to them to use. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.